Well, hello and welcome to today's video. I thought it was time we had a bit of a Norman's wisdom as I haven't done one of those for a while. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today, well, and what I'm going to try and be talking about today, which I've tried several times already and not really eloquently put it, and so I've canned all these videos, but hopefully this one will be the one that actually works, is the fact that sometimes we all need a reality check. Um, and I'll explain that. I'm going to wrap that up in a couple of subjects. One being your level as a photographer and two, the dreaded AI. But we'll talk about those in a minute. Where am I today? Well, actually, I can tell you exactly where I am because I've got a nice little National Trust marker here. It tells me that I am at the Moleskin and Markham Hills. Now, that sounds far-fetched and lovely and sort of exotic, doesn't it? But it's actually five minutes away from where I live. Up that way is Sharp and Ho Clappers. Um, and down that way, I haven't got a clue. And down that way is where I've just come from, but I think I've got to go up there. The reason I'm here is because I've been scouting the location to see if it's any good for a bit of woodland photography, which can I say the jury's out on, I'm not quite sure, but it's still useful to come to these places and have a look because you never know. I saw it on the map and I saw how close by it was and I thought, well, I'll have a little browse. And the good thing is, is I've been looking for a while to set up a little uh, outdoor sort of in a local woodland bird feeding station to try and get a few local birds in, which, uh, which may be different from the ones in my garden. And there's a couple of really nice little spots I think I found sort of further up that way, which would be really useful. Anyway, um, I hope that you've been enjoying my London A to Z street photography series. I've really enjoyed it. I uh, haven't been out since Green Park. Uh, but I have got H and I sorted. I know exactly where I'm going. Uh, it's just a question of basically um, getting out. So I'm hoping to do that within the next week or so. So they should be back. I've got another couple of places that I've scouted around here for some woodland photography. And when the conditions are right, I'll definitely be back there. And I hope that you're, I hope you enjoyed my last woodland photography video, even if it was a bit of a plug for KNF concept. But I will say I wasn't lying about that. That filter, it's now on my camera, so I'm, I'm really pleased with it, I've got to say. Anyway, on to the main subject of today, if I can get it across to you enough and I don't just dump another video. I want to talk to you a little bit about a reality check and why having a reality check is really important for your progression as a photographer. It's actually important, really, for your progression as a person, but mainly as a photographer. And what sparked me into talking about this was the fact that uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was in Snowdonia with the podcast guys. Uh, Sam wasn't there, unfortunately. You were missed, by the way, Sam. Uh, but on the Saturday, we just climbed up this hill, um, and I summited, actually, and I was quite pleased with that. Uh, got some reasonable photos. I might pop them up as I'm speaking, just to overlay them. A couple of nice photos. When we got down, uh, we, we ventured into a pub, and we were sat around this uh, little bench outside, and Stuart, um, because he'd won uh, a category in the uh, natural landscapes competition that Alex now runs, uh, had a copy of the book which had been sent to him. And he said, oh, you know, do you want to take a look? So I was leafing, leafing through these pages and I was absolutely blown away by the standard and the, and the actual images in this photography book. It was unbelievable. And it was not only unbelievable because of the compositions and the conditions. Well, let's not say compositions, but the conditions and the locations. Because, you know, most of us can't get to a lot of these far-flung places. All of these, you know, these images were from all around the world. Some close to home, but an awful lot from further afield. And they were unbelievable. So, you know, snow on, on, snow on trees making them look like lollipops that were backlit with a big orange glow around the outside just stuff you're not going to get here um, but it wasn't that it wasn't that that blew me away and, and of course that's a big part of the the reason these photographs were so successful but there's a there's another thing there's an extra 10 20 percent that these photographers have in their creative eye uh, like for instance there was a shot of, of a, it was a woodland shot and it's a shot that I'd have just literally dismissed and walked past and it was this snapped branch so it was surrounded by these other you know smaller branches but this one big branch was snapped and the colour contrast between this fresh wood 
where the branch was snapped and the and the old wood that had been exposed to everything and the uh, surroundings and the way it was composed just made it such a fantastic and like interesting image and a lot of these images were that type of shot where you are you look at it and then you have to look at it again and then you have to look at it again almost to say well what is that i don't quite get how that that shot's arrived here or you know there were some jaw dropping ones which you're just not going to get of volcanoes and things like that which which you know are right place right time still well composed and still well well executed but right place right time but there were some which were just so creative so different and it really really made me look at my photography and think you know it's really very easy to think you're at a certain level with your photography or you're at a good level with your photography because all of your contemporaries all of your social media cohort your your bubble they're all doing pretty much the same thing you find your level within them and when you look at the the let's say you look at a, a woodland image that you've taken and you compare it to the people that you follow on Twitter, most of the people you follow on Twitter, the people you talk to, the people you spend time with, the people that you that you watch on YouTube, and you go, ah, oh, do you know what? Actually, my photography is pretty much up there with their photography, you know, if not better in in a number of circumstances, you know, than their photography. So you think, ah, oh, actually, do you know what? I'm doing quite well. But then looking at this book, which is really another step ahead makes you realise that actually gives you that reality check that you're not doing as well as you think you're doing or you're not doing that well compared to other people and there's still a long way to go. And I think it's really important for any level of photographer, whatever circle that you're mixing in, to look at other work, you know, the real top work. Because, you know, right now, if I hadn't have looked at that book, for instance, and I don't know, I see one of my one of my contemporaries who may have a few more subscribers than me charging, you know, let's say 700 quid for a workshop for a one to one for a day. I might look at that and go, OK, well, you know, he's of a good level because he's, you know, he's around where I'm at. So therefore, you know, if he wants to charge that, fair enough. I'd never think that, to be honest with you. But um, when you look at this other work and then you pair that up, with someone charging 700 quid a day for a workshop, you think, well, that's scandalous. And, and I would advise everybody, you know, to, especially if you're thinking of doing something like that, to A, look at this book, and then B, look in the mirror and say, can I really justify this? Can I really justify doing that, even if there's a market out there, you know? And I don't want this to be about people charging extortionate prices for workshops. I want it more to be about, you know, helping you to, to have a reality check. But there is a bit of that in it, you know, just because you've got 20, 30, 40, 50,000 subscribers on YouTube, you need to look at the products you're producing in terms of what you're actually trying to sell. So if you're trying to sell yourself as a photographer and then you look at your work and it is way below the work that's coming out in this book, it shows how far you've got to go. And I bet you a lot of money that the vast majority of those photographers, even the very, very good ones, even the category winners, even people we may know, are only charging about half of that for a day. So, you know, it's important. I'm not going to dwell on that any longer, but I think it's important to, to look at your level and don't get carried away by other things. Don't get carried away by the likes or the subscribers, or even the, hmm, how can I put this? I'm not going to call them sycophants. I'm going to, I'm going to say the people who are genuinely rooting for you uh, on whatever platform you're on and tell you that your stuff's great, regardless of whether it is great or whether it isn't great, if that makes sense. Have a look at yourself. Be self-critical. And really, honestly, this landscape book, this natural landscape book, is 60 quid, right? Which to me is like, whew, I'm not paying 60 quid for a book. But if you can get hold of the book, and if you are prepared to pay 60 quid for the book, or you can even view a copy of it, have a look at it online. I think there's a PDF version with some of the images online. Just have a look at that and just then compare yourself to that and ask yourself, where am I really at? You know, And then maybe that will help you to improve as a photographer 
and also maybe help you to improve a little bit as a person and to maybe have a bit of a reality check as to where your skills are uh, and uh, perhaps how much your skills are worth. Anyway, let's move on to the second part of this when we're talking about reality checks. And this one is about the dreaded AI. And the only reason I'm saying this is because I saw a video the other day uh, from someone uh, and it said, is landscape photography dead? I think, or landscape photography is dying, question mark, something along those lines. And it was a very eloquent piece, or well said, and uh, in it, uh, the, uh, the orator had put up several images of local, of landmarks, um, which, um, which looked very good. And then later on told us that these were AI images, which let's be honest, you can tell. But anyway, later on said, oh, these are, these are AI images. Uh, but the thing that, that, that struck me, that struck a chord with me with, with this video was that there was a point where, where the, the, uh, the orator or the narrator said, um, if you can sit at a computer and you can generate these images without having to get up and go out and take the photo, then why would you do it? You've killed landscape photography. You don't need to do it anymore. And I thought to myself, that's totally missing the point, isn't it? Because if you think about it, AI can produce these images, but these images have been, have been, have been produced for years and years and years by another form of intelligence, and that's your fellow human beings. So if you go onto Google and you type in the Lone Tree at Clamberis, or the Old Man of Store, or, I don't know, Red Kite at Dusk, I don't know, anything like that, you're going to see images that have been generated by someone else. Doesn't matter whether it's AI or doesn't matter whether it's another person. They've been generated and they haven't been done or made by you. So if that's the case and you actually take that to the next level, then if you can Google the old man at store and you can see it, then why bother going to the old man of store and taking the shot yourself? Well, that's the point of why you love landscape photography, isn't it? Or whatever genre of photography. It's not about just having the image, it's about getting the image. It's about going out, it's about experiencing that place, it's about experiencing the journey to that place. It's about the satisfaction of you creating that image, creating it in terms of setting yourself up, composing it, taking the shot, waiting for the light perhaps, and then having that shot on your memory card, getting home, processing it, and styling it the way that you want it to look. And then you get the final image. And yeah, sure, AI, well, AI can't do that because AI can't take a photograph of the old man's store yet. Maybe in a year's time it will, but maybe AI can do that. But then there's thousands of other versions of intelligence, i.e. other people who've also already done that and made it freely available on the internet. But that doesn't mean you don't want to go take it, does it? Because you love photography, that's the point. You love the whole experience. That's why I do it. I love it because it's a, it's a hobby. It's like everything around it. So I would suggest if your attitude towards it is, well, if AI can generate it and I can just tap it in a few lines into a computer, it can generate the image, then why do I need to go out and do it myself? Well, you're probably, you know, in the wrong job, have the wrong hobby, you know? Because if the point of it is it's so much more than just that picture at the end of the day. Because let's face it, if you wanted to collect pictures like that at the end of the day, you, you don't have to distribute them, but you could just download them off the internet. You could just go onto Flickr and screenshot every good shot from every place and go, got it. Old Man of Store, got it. Lone Tree at Lamberis, got it. Buttermere Tree, got it. Langdale Pikes, got it. Because I've just searched it online and downloaded it, but that isn't the point. We're not collectors, are we? Well, maybe we are collectors, maybe, but maybe we're collectors of experiences and collectors of memories and collectors of achievements rather than just collectors of that image. So, you know, maybe we need a bit of a reality check there. AI will kill some versions of photography without doubt. If you're a, a photographer who takes pictures of food and puts them on stock image sites or two people laughing at a computer, you know, or a water cooler in an office, yeah, AI is probably going to kill that. You know, there's no, more, there's no mileage left in that, unfortunately. But if you're a hobbyist and you love photography, then AI could never kill that because it can't ever take away what you experience. So there's your reality check. 
Anyway, I hope that you've enjoyed that. I did get through it, and I think maybe I've kind of put that across a bit better than I normally do. Now, I've got to go back up that hill. <laughs> maybe I'll come back at the top and let you know how bad it was, but I suspected I'm knackered. That's where I came from. Until then, I want to say thank you very much for watching. I really hope you've enjoyed this Norman's Wisdom. Uh, I will be back next time, maybe from a woodland, maybe from London, maybe with some wildlife, who knows? Maybe with another rant. Uh, but until then, I'll see you later, and thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.